My name is Jerry Blackburn. I'm also an Apollo engineer uh, veteran from the site, and I've been conducting and moderating these interviews. It's For me, it's, it's like old home week. We get to sit and talk with... Uh, commiserate together in terms of what what our experience and past memories and so I'd like you to join us on this this journey down uh, memory lane of some of the things that happened Anthony let's start out uh, I like to find out are you uh, did you come to California or I was born in, in Los Angeles born and raised right here right. so you're native California right so when you started your career in aerospace, Anthony, how did that all begin? How did you? Well, I was looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. Yeah. Well, I was working at Sears, and I didn't like working there, and I, I decided to go to community college. I got, a, uh, got a, an associate of arts degree in electronics. Which college? Occup you... East Los Angeles College. East L.A. Oh, great. Yeah, right. And uh, they had an excellent program for electronics, so... Uh -huh. I took every course they had in electronics, and I liked the teachers there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very good instructors. One guy was uh, used to teach at MIT, and the other one's a Navy guy, and he, he knew a lot. Yeah, yeah. Great. One's practical, one's theoretical, so yeah. it was really good. What time frame is this? What year? 1957. 57, late 50s, yeah. I was taking a night course in electronics. Mm -hmm. I failed the class, and, <laughs> but I liked it, so I figured I would do better, yeah. and, and I took everything. And then I finally graduated. It took me about three years to get out of there. And uh, when I got out, they told me, uh, the advisor told me, the, uh, the placement advisor, he t told me to go to uh, 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 Downey to Autonetics, and they were hiring down there. I went down there, and uh, I took the exam, and I failed it about two or three times. I finally got in. That was the main time I was working at uh, Yates Garage for the telephone company as a contract employee. So eventually I got in. I went to get in that place really bad because it could be in my field. And... Uh, I was really glad I got in. It was you know, paid good, good wages, and you know most people. I was used to working. Do you remember what your starting wage was when you came? Yeah, it was two dollars. I think two dollars and five cents or ten cents an hour. Two oh five. That was big oh. money then. The minimum wage was a dollar an hour. So that's yeah. like right now it'd be like sixteen dollars an hour. Sure, sure. So that's not bad, and uh, and it was. And I walked in there, and uh, they offered me a job with more money. My dad was an aircraft worker too. He worked for Lockheed. Hmm. He actually worked for North American Aviation in World War Two. You built the B-25s. Oh, yeah. And they, they built them in Lin, uh, what do you call it, Linwood? But it was really El Segundo. El Segundo, right. Yeah, they, right. but they called it Linwood at that time and uh, during World War II. And then he, <laughs> he got laid off, I guess, after the war. And then he came, came back when the Korean War started, he started working at Lockheed. And he worked on everything. He worked at the Skunk Works, everywhere. <laughs> he, was, he was electrical also. He was an electrician. Yeah. So he really didn't like it. So it was all in the family then. Yeah, but he didn't like that work. He's he's a musician and he hated working every day. So I hate working out this place. But you know, people <laughs> mind a lot. But it couldn't have been that bad because he worked it 20 years so till he retired. So that kind of led me in that direction. I, I used to clip articles from Von Braun. He was talking about going to the moon. I thought that, that we were going to go. I, I thought we were going to go. You know. So you were in your element when you came to work for Autonetics here at Downey. Not really. We were making things, missiles of mass destruction. We were making oh. the minute missiles. Yes. And I hated it because I was against nuclear stuff, you know. And, uh, and uh, but and nobody else felt guilty about it except me, you know. But, <laughs> but I felt that we should make it as good as we can. But he went those missiles fall in the United States instead of yeah. Russia or China, wherever they're going to send them to. Yeah. So I tried to do the best job I could. Sure. And uh, it, it was it was good work. We made, we meet uh, the guidance systems for the Minuteman missile, and I was an inspector. But the guys who were in there were the ones in the functional test were older guys, like in their late twenties. Mm -hmm and early 30s, and these guys were all right out of the service, and they were like 22 like I was, you know. So I thought they were a bunch of good guys. So we, I liked it. We, got, we used to go drinking out on Fridays and everything. It was, it was a lot of camaraderie with those inspectors. Sure. And then the other people hated us because we were the inspectors, and because uh, we would tell them everything they did wrong, and it, we were you know, deciding their career, you know, because yeah. they would fire them. They'd get to, to, to do some bad work. We'd have, it's really bad. We had to turn in our own inspector. But like my buddy he hired in there, and he did a bad job. He, 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 they assembled something. They inspected it. They left some parts out. And they got into functional tests when I was in there. I, I saw it. The, the parts were missing. It was a, it was a read ride board that I knew of. It was a 57-673-501 board. And it was used on the, uh, for the Midman uh, D-17 computer. And we were running tests on it. The parts were missing on it. And it passed functional tests. I couldn't believe it. 
if it was missing parts. So then I noticed the parts were only there. Then I saw the who inspected an assembly was my friend. Oh, so he, they gave him a hard time on, on that, and he gave me a hard time too. So it was terrible because you didn't even have to turn in on your own friends, you know. So that's part of the inspection. You got to do the, you know, you do the job, you know. It, it, uh, nepotism and all that stuff doesn't count. Inspection was always a very difficult uh, job in terms of any of our programs in production because you were relying on someone who, in most cases, they didn't know the design, they didn't know how it was prepared or even the major details of it. But the one quality we found in our inspectors was they were extremely careful and they knew how to read specifications and requirements, which is not all we could, we could say about some of the people in production. And so uh, inspectors were a lifeline to us to make sure that our products going out were going well, we to be We police the product. That yes. We were the policeman for the product. We were sure the product was correct. Yeah. And if it, you know, and that made me kind of bad too because I, I was colorblind when I, <laughs> and I, I know how to pass the colorblind tests, but I have trouble <laughs> with my colors. Now, you were here at Autonetics just before they left the site for Anaheim. Yes, uh, we were here in the, uh, when I hired in was in June, mm -hmm. and then they moved to probably in March of the following year. Just, I, I hired in 61, so they were March 62, and uh, we moved to uh, Billion 220, I believe it's called. We had a lot of women. It was, it was like Rosie the Riveters. Oh, I, yeah. I hate to walk down. I was a young guy, and I hate to walk down the aisle because they'd like to pinch your butt. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, you know, my. That's, yes. The older gals. In well, we talk, in their 30s. <laughs> we talk about the Compton facility. What's that? Remember the Compton facility? Yes. Uh, I, I really empathized uh, with the, the ladies who used to walk uh, in, in, by construction sites because I was only 17, 18 at the time when I came over and I had to go to Compton. Compton facility was one of our primary electronic fabrication facilities. And I would say that 99% of the employees there were women right, there, because of their there. skills. Women have a much better skill set for electronic fabrication. They can handle the detail work, and they do it so much better. Well, I had on occasion a, a responsibility to go over there and check one of the clean rooms out. And I had never been to the facility before. And as I went into the building, the supervisor's office was at the very, very back of the building. And I had to walk down through the middle of this building on these huge bays with all of these women working at and their station. And you were a young station. guy then too, right? Yes. I didn't understand what a cat call was until I walked that ramp to the back where the supervisor was. And then I realized right. what was going on. Right. That's just... Well, I used to work with those girls, so it was every, yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. So you get to know them, they're okay. <laughs> the, oh, they were they're wonderful people, wonderful people. Uh, you eventually went from uh, the, uh, the Minuteman-type programs. Uh, you got involved with the Saturn S2? Yeah, what happened, the, the Minuteman program, they started going to the, uh, we were doing the Minuteman 1, and they went to the Minuteman 2, and the Minuteman 2, uh, we were using uh, electronic components that were uh, discrete and stuff, and I mean, the, and they went from t into integrated circuits, so they wouldn't have to have these individual components put together. So that they had to, they had to, they could cut all the crew down. Uh -huh. So the, an integrated circuit would take a place of maybe ten boards or something. Yes. And uh, we were, we had maybe about, uh, I think, 60, 65 boards per computer. Mm -hmm. So there, they just put a few. Uh, they, they'd have a lot of integrated circuits, but so it's smaller and everything. The the computer that we had in uh, the D17 with all those old. Uh, transistors and diodes and stuff mm -hmm. was about the size of a washing machine oh. and uh, the, the, when they made the, the, the two the, the, it was the size of about maybe uh, a bread box and uh, from there I got kicked out and we, we got laid off the day I got laid off on Friday I worked night shifts so what I did I, I hired that we knew we were gonna get laid off there was the unions kind of thing they you notified it, mm -hmm. everybody and I hired in, and uh, on Friday morning, I hired in at uh, Space Division. I went back to Downey, which is here. Mm -hmm. I went to Building 4. There was an employment uh -huh. there. We hired in there, reported to work that night, and then they gave us our, 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 our papers to be discharged. So I started work Monday. Whoa. So I didn't miss anything. At didn't all. miss anything at all. Did you ever have occasion to get over to the uh, 
uh, facility over at Los Alamitos? Yeah, not right away. What happened? I got promoted, and I went. I got uh, promoted to put me on, on, on Billy in Billy 290, where they were making the Apollo. Mm-hmm. And I, I walked in the door, and uh, it was like. Science fiction. You walk in the door and you see all these spacecrafts being uh, being made and yeah. tested and everything, and all these technicians running around with white uniforms and you know, that uh, smocks they had on with caps and booties. They were mm-hmm. the booties and stuff. And uh, it was a clean room and it was huge. They had a low bay. What they call a, a low bay is a, it's a it's a high bay, and then they have a higher bay. They call yeah. it the high bay, and then they have the low bay. Okay, so. Our low bay was about forty foot ceiling, and then the high bay went up to sixty foot. Right. Because we had a stack. We had to stack the we had to stack the service module on top a uh, uh, service module and then the Apollo command module so and then that had to go into a ground stand and so by the time you started stacking this stuff uh, you ran out of ceiling real quick and yeah what, let me show you what sure. it is they had this Apollo is in two parts they got this part is called a service module and that part has the rocket the rocket engine in the back, it's got the fuel, it's got the oxygen and hydrogen for the fuel. It has batteries and, uh, oh, I forgot to call the, it's, it's like a liquid battery if it's a... Fuel cells. Fuel, fuel cells. cells. Yeah, the fuel cells. Fuel they cells. had the fuel cells in right. there. That's like, I think three of them in there. Right. And they had a lot of other uh, tubing and other type of gases like uh, water glycol and stuff. And uh, so... Also, we had an extra potable water and oxygen tanks in here. Yeah, but it was it was loaded with tanks. I was electrical, right. so I didn't really get involved yes. much in that. Uh-huh. So then, and then this part here comes off. It looks like this, mm-hmm. and they stack it into this uh, thing, and uh, th- th- so it's two parts. This is uh, the command modules, which is really the cockpit of the of the of the uh, spaceship. And they mount it together, and it looks like that when it's done. And yes. so when they they would, the cranes there wouldn't were not strong enough. They couldn't pick up the whole thing. So they would pick it up in sections. They would pick up this part, and then they would pick up this part. It, or else it was, because the, the, the cranes there were not strong enough to pick them up, or they'd break, you know? So then you, what they did, they had these things called uh, integrated test stands, and we used to call them stacks. And it's like a three-story thing, looks like a director set, and it had like uh, doors in the front, and they would slide this thing in like this, and then they'd bring the crane and put the other one in here. And uh, then they'd close the doors, and they'd have th- uh, three stories high, I think, with four stories for the, the top. And this was a top deck. It would wheel around like this. And the guys would, from the end there, you could go in and out of the, the command module on the top. It was, and each, each floor had a landing around it so they could work on the service module because there was a lot of stuff they got. These things were all open. You could see all the tanks and stuff and wiring and, and pipes and whatever they had in there. The command, we had five uh, ground stands yeah. in, in the facility. So well, you can when imagine I was, this whole assembly line with all these yeah, vehicles. Yeah, when I went down there at first, they had four. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. There, there was a, like there was a viewing window like this in the middle of the, of the building 290, and the, and then they had two test stands uh, uh, stacks on both sides. Mm-hmm. The middle one was what they what they would use for putting in the heat shields and stuff, and they also do it at the end. They used it for photo ops and stuff. Mm-hmm. But anyway, they they would put we'd put them in the test stands. And then we start, uh, and these, these particular, uh, this part here, and being this uh, lunar module, the lunar module sticks in here. It looks like a spider. Mm-hmm. That's the one that actually lands on the moon. We didn't get involved in that at all. But that, that opening was, uh, we used to bring in all the plumbing. The plumbing, the, the cables, and everything came through. It looks like a rat's nest coming <laughs> in on the top. And then they put like a cover on it so it looks so, so bad. And uh, so all the, the connections and stuff were, would, would be inside the command module, and it was just loaded with wires. I think we had 560 switches and stuff, and we had dozens and dozens of fuses all over the place, and uh, it was pretty well organized. They had, like, the electrical part was all the electrical switches one pla- uh, were kind of like two or three places, and then the the other parts, the communication was one in one location, so they had it pretty well s- sectionalized so you could see what was going on. Now, you were actually getting into these command modules and, and doing your, your job as a technician. Uh, tell, t- re- repeat the story with Gus Grissom. Oh, Grissom came in there. He was always sitting inside the bird there, and we didn't have the, the seats that they have for the... When you're building it, you don't have the seats. That it goes in last, the ones that they sit in for, to launch and stuff. So all you had was the... They had the mat and the, 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 the top of all the cables and stuff, and uh, we would sit like Indians, like a TP, 
and uh, we'd be there and you'd be surrounded with all this instrumentation and stuff. But you know, you'd, after a few days, you don't even notice it anymore. You're just, you're just inside of a room. And uh, Grissom come walking in. He'd been, we'd, he'd been working. All the astronauts were, were kind of rotating in there and running their test. What we did, we ran the test first to get it pretty much what works. And then the astronauts come in and work with us and, and then make sure it works properly. And uh, so he came in one day. He he came his little. He's had this jump shoot. They had a little same kind of outfit we had, but they had different colors, like gray or something. And he comes in with a lemon. I didn't know it was a lemon. I thought it was an orange with a with a with a string on it. Cause I'm not colorblind, so oranges and le and lemons look the same. So then he hung this thing on top with a string on top of the bird. It was hanging to the middle. Of, and I said, "What the heck are you doing?" He says, "He says he told me this is a lemon." And then I got it. <laughs> I said, I didn't think this thing was a lemon. You know, I we were doing a good job on it. It was kind of an insult. I said, but everybody thought it was funny, you know, to put the lemon on there. But uh, it turned out he was right. And uh, that was spacecraft one, it burned up uh, at the launch stand. That was. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty bad. But anyway, one. at that time, things were going good. It was, it, I, I listened to the, recently I saw somebody put uh, the procedure with, just before he, uh, the, audio on the on YouTube and you don't see anything but you could hear the voices and it was just a standard test we always did I could hear Grissom talking and white those guys uh, there was two tests they ran on they run a plugs in they plugged all this stuff in they call it the plugs in test then they took all the wires off and then they ran a plugs out test and the plugs in they were they were connected to all the, the hardware and stuff in the, in the building the plugs out they, they had to, all the stuff that had to go through the uh, RF room communication because that's originally what they had to do no no connectors on there well, let me explain a little bit about a good time there about the a station a station what this thing was called an a station they had the building 290 had these high base and then they had these integrated station section and they were con and they, the cabling mm -hmm. and plumbing and stuff were connected into the, the they called uh, a room with a bunch of panels uh, they had like a tall uh, Consoles and they had all they had was connectors in there. It was like a rat's nest of stuff mm -hmm. in there. And it, you go in, it was dark and they had cables laying all over the ground and stuff. And they're all connected. And then what they did, these these uh, were the connecting se se section would go, go to the con uh, control room. And the control room, it looks like the launch center or, or Master or Houston, where you see all those monitors and stuff. It looks very similar. And uh, it has a bunch of consoles with, with uh, monitors and and uh, chart recorders on the wall. There was just a lot of equipment in there. And I thought they were running the computers and stuff. We talk about it, they say, but they talked about the computer. And we were in the integrated set. And all that stuff was secret. So they wouldn't tell us about what was going to the control room. The control room guys wouldn't talk about what was going on in the third. And then there was a computer room. I didn't even realize that the computer room was a separate room with a computer in it. They had a, an old mainframe uh, computer. So they had two of them in there. And the mainframe computers, like you see in the movies, the old movies, where they had reels and stuff, and <laughs> magnetic tapes, and they had, uh, they had, uh, they had cards like this. They had the printed circuit cards. They looked like this, and they would use these printed circuit cards to program the computer. Not like you do with the keyboards now. They would go to a key punch machine and key punch every line. Like this was one line with one one letter code, and they'd have thousands of these things, and they'd have a big pile of them. And that, that was with a key punch. And then that, that's how they programmed them. And then they put it in, they go, go, go to uh, the tape reels. And the tape reels, had, cause they, they could go faster than doing that directly. And then they would save it on tape reels. And then they would run it through uh, the computer and that would program the computer. And I believe they used Fortran on some of it. And uh, which is just another programming language. Fortran is like an app. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So they had, and they had different apps. One app to run the whole test on the bird. Another app to run just the uh, life support system. Another app to run uh, uh, power. Another app for communication. Another one for uh, uh, for guidance. And, and it was like eleven things they had there. Nine or eleven. And uh, so that was called the A station, the, the control room with all these engineers and stuff, all the monitors. And then they had the computer in the room, and then they had uh, the, the uh, stacks that we were talking about. And they're all connected together with cables. And what they did, it was supposed to be an automatic test. So they would push one button, and the button would run the test through the, like for the uh, life support. They had a button, they, they were called, uh, God, I can't think of the name of it right now. 
There was the R start uh, uh, relays. They're called R start relay, the K start relay, the C start relays. And the R start relays were all on all those mon uh, and all of the uh, monitors that they have in the control room. And then they had one control room that was in the, in the computer room too. It, it was divided in there, and it had uh, they had a, a R start in there too. And uh, then they had then in the computer room they had a a C start, and the C start you hit that button, and that would run the complete test on the on the, on the computer on the checkout of the bird. They would test uh, thousands of points. It would it would take you months to try to do what the computer did. And they did it. It was supposed to run in eight hours. Well, it took us three months because <laughs> we, we, we had this thing. They had to print out for those these cards. It was about this about this high, and it, they had these old IBM things with little holes, perforated paper. And they're all folded like this in like a big stack, if you can remember those kind of days. But and we we get a few uh, sheets and we put it in the command module. And the guys in the control room had the complete book, and we'd be in there. We'd go. We knew it wasn't going to go very far, so we'd go. Yeah. We'd go three or four lines, and it it would fail. And then we have to run around the place figure figure out what it was. If it was a wire yeah. disconnected or a plumbing or somebody without then put into. Uh, connect the connector for the uh, pressure valve or something. So, the, or the water glycol was not right, running right. Yeah, the water glycol was a, a cooling system. This is a strange water they had. We used to use that to clean the bird with too. It was our cleaning solvent, and it was terrible. It didn't clean nothing. But uh, it's all that we could use because they didn't want to contaminate the bird with water yes. and stuff. Right. And the, the water glycol pump was outside the building on the north side of the building tonight. Mm -hmm. And they had we had a technician there. His job was just to stay there. And make sure, and, he, and we had an intercom system. To everybody in the and the, every guy, I had a uh, an intercom, and all like common. So you can't all talk it. Everybody was talking at once. Only they had a guy called a test conductor. He was in the control room, and he would run the whole test on this stuff. And uh, he and he'd call the the guy water glycol, WPR. I think it was called WK. Yeah, WPR was water glycol. And they had a, an old technician who was there like in his 50s. And his job was to monitor that stuff. Well, every once in a while he'd fall asleep. So we'd go down to figure out well, how come he's not working. So we, we went in there and uh, we were all camaraderie stuff. We'd wake him up and say, Can we wake up? You know, it gives us a boring job. We're night shift. We were there for 17 hours, okay? So it's, and he's not doing anything but sitting there outside in the dark. He had a little light or something. So. So everybody hated that job, and he's the only guy who liked it. So they put him in there, and he liked doing that job. So it, it, he got vote, he voted in, and uh, that was his main job. And and you you see, there's a picture they show the of Apollo tw uh, one, and he's on the outside there. He's one of the guys talking. Really guy. He's kind of a heavy guy, an older guy. He's a good guy. I think his name was Mel. But most of, most of the tests that you were running were long, tedious, complicated it tests. Be eight hours. Yeah, it took us three months. <laughs> three months, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we finally got all the bugs in it, and when they went to the Cape, they would actually run them in eight hours. In January twenty seventh, nineteen sixty seven, the Cape was testing that spacecraft with the three astronauts on board, and a decision had been made that they were going to do a, uh, a full-up power-up test with a 100% oxygen atmosphere, which later resulted in a catastrophic failure. However, Anthony, was that the only time that test no, was run? No, we did that. We did a static test. We didn't have the electronics on and everything. They, they put it on the middle of the floor. Before they shipped this it out. This is here in Building 290. Building 290, they put it, and they ran a static test on it, and uh, they had it filled with pure oxygen, and at that time, the doors were not even quick opening. I, I was the guy who put the door in and had all these uh, uh, recessed screws that were inside, mm -hmm. long, and we, had, we were only allowed to use torque wrenches. So it took maybe a, maybe about two hours to put the door on, to just to get the door on, because we had two guys working on it, trying to get mm -hmm. it done quick, quick. Maybe it was an hour. So we button those you know, astronauts are in there, and I was worried about. It. We had the safety engineer says, "Well, we, we give this guy a fire extinguisher or something." And, so, and then he said, "Well, no, it, the oxygen is not combustible." And I, said, I didn't believe. Him. I said, "This guy's lying." And so I went. To, I was taking chemistry at the time, and I took. I went to the locker, and I had my because I used to take my, I used to take my books to, to work, and uh, every once in a while you had a chance to to read a few pages. I you do it. You know, there was, we were sitting around all the time, you know, so I couldn't take the book into the test area, but I could, you know, keep in my mind and train what was going on. And uh, 
I had opened it to the CRC tables with a chemi chemi it's a chemistry table book, and I looked up what the, the characteristics of oxygen, and in there it says oxygen is non-combustible, and I thought about it. well I guess he's right you know so I didn't I let, I let it die there, and uh, so we they finished the test and then they they shipped them out, so later on they what they did wrong on that my what I was reading later on that. The, it's the it's the amount of oxygen you have in the in the bird, the, the concentration, and uh, when they were going to have, I think they need 11 or 12 pounds of, of, of uh, oxygen, they were it's supposed to be out in space 12 pounds. Now 12 pounds of oxygen, in space, is a lot less dense than if you're in and uh, 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 and with gravity and and uh, and in the atmosphere, like they were. So the the concentration of oxygen is uh, like 10 times as much. So when you're up in space, you have pure oxygen. It's, it's not that hazardous. It's not that combustible. It is very combustible when you makes it makes everything else combustible. With with oxygen, you can weld. Okay, you can make me metal burn. Okay, so what the, the fix on that later after they had, they had the fire is they had a dual gas system. Now the Russians had a dual gas system too, and the, and they were trying to save weight on their pole, so they didn't do that. But so they kept the two dual gas system just in the ground at a smaller tank. And they vented the, the air out as they went up to space, and they became pure. The 12, they got the 11, 12 pounds when they were up in space. So that's how they addressed the problem in the, after the fire. But they still kept with the dual gas. I don't see why they need the dual gas. They couldn't just have the dual gas system the Russians were using on their uh, on their spacecraft. And uh, the, 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 the thing you're talking about was that the myth at the time is that the Russians had, co had gotten the bends by coming down with the dual, dual gas system. And that you can't get the bends by doing that. I think we, but they did have it, but not after the Apollo landed on the moon, they had a problem with that. But they said that was, that was one of the myths. They, they said that was, a, it was really not that. They just wanted to keep the weight down. And it, it worked, you know, it was safer then. And they learned a lot by doing that. And, uh, you, know, you know, everybody's not perfect. You know, they, you know, you go in there, we had so many different systems. Everything was so new. We didn't know what we were doing. We're walking in. And uh, I walked in that place. They put me in, when I was talking about walking in the door, they just put me to work. So go put this package inside the, we had these little kits, put it inside the bird. And, and the birds, like I said, they didn't have, it, they didn't have any uh, seats in there. So, but still, there was not a room in there. You walk in this bird, and you have your kit, and then you have to, get, you have to bring drawing and your tools and everything, and you bring it in. And they had somebody at the door check you to make sure everything is there, so you take everything out, the debris. So we went in there, and we did our, did our thing. You know, put our uh, maybe a little panel that had a, a radio or something. We stuck it in there. You know, it's not a radio, but it's you know to simplify it for somebody. And we put it in, and we put the connectors and stuff, and then we'd jump out. Well, there was a line of guys there because we could only get one one or two guys inside that bird. To, you got to move around in there. You can't have five or six people in there. It was all you know all welded together. And it had this little hatch. So <laughs> you're in there. You know, there's only one opening. So there was only only two guys could work in there. Trying to get three guys or something, they could be bumping into each other. And craft guys don't aren't good at working in crowds. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd get our job done, and the next guy standing in line would go in. Well, sometimes the line got too. We had I think eight guys in our crew, or ten guys, and uh, they'd be standing in line there, and it didn't look good to upper management. So our lower manager would tell, "Go go hide, you know, tell you're gonna, this guy's going to take a few hours to do his job." Sometimes, you know. So we'd get a cart, hand cart, or we. Go to building one. Building one is this huge building. It's like almost a square f mile, it's like a half square mile. And they were, that's where they were fabricating all the, the, the Apollo spacecraft. And you see, you go by, you could see all the the, 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 the building. There was like an assembly line. You could see them, like you see those air, old aircraft, uh, World War II things. You see parts of the, the wings and stuff being put together. Well, that's where these things were too. They were putting them together in like an assembly line. Then they'd come into building 29 and they would continue that thing and go into the test dance. Because they were putting more parts and doing some testing on it and then they finally got the, the final was going into the uh, integrated test dance. So they, we, were the, we were the tip of the sword. We were the very end before we went out. And then from there they'd ship it off to, we had a big giant door and they had a, a, a transport, like a, an auto transport. They'd take the service module and the command module and they'd, and they'd drive it, I think it was Long Beach, they'd drive it off to Long Beach and put it in this big, fat transport plane. And, and it opened up, it was called the Guppy. And then they'd fly it to the Cape or wherever they're going to send it to, most of them were sent to the Cape. 
Well, they had one that went to Houston. It was, it was called 2TV1. It was like a, it was simulator. But uh, anyway, the, that's kind of the way the assembly was. And we were, so we were lost in those, it's all dark, we're going around with the carts and stuff. And my, my friend was a Vietnam vet. He says, we shouldn't be going down the same way, the same, go back the way we came because the Viet Cong be waiting for us. So his strategy was go come back a different route. So that's what we used to do. We'd go all over, the, over the place and come back. Billing was a great place to hide. <laughs> <laughs> but we were working 17 hours, so they, you couldn't be trying to walk around the car for 17 <laughs> hours. You know? So we'd come back and then we'd see how, what the schedule was. If we were next in line, we'd just get to do our job and get that done. A lot of times it was a lot of complicated problems to get the, uh, it was the first time they had done this and screws and stuff wouldn't work. The guys were all frustrated. They said, well, we'll just bring them all the screws that actually fit from the hardware store. They'd bring them with them. And that was the wrong thing to do. I said, no, it should be, you know, their technician can do whatever they want. You know, I said, should we do that? These guys are engineered for special weights and everything with these, these screws. The screws we had were real strange. They had, they looked like uh, Phillips screws. But it, a Phillips screws, it, you could, they had a, a ridge on one side and they're smooth on the other side. So you could turn and tighten the screw but when you try to back it off, it wouldn't back off because it would slip because there's nothing to, to grab onto. So in order to get those off, you have to drill and tap them and pull them out. Now, I had the magic hand. I could go in there and put enough pressure and, and back them out. I could back those screws out because they were just, they were torqued in. And they were, so not really over to tight. They were just, just right. So I didn't, they, they thought it was the guy with the magic hands. I would go in there and get behind the connectors. I could see things backwards in my mind, you know, and I to take the connectors off and had really good field vision in there. So that, that, they gave me real tough uh, installations. Early when Apollo uh, was uh, decided that we were going to fly Apollo, President Kennedy said, uh, I, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of this decade. And for many of us, it was uh, OK, easy for you to say. But then all of a sudden, those of us that got the contract and had to go build it, well, what do you want? Uh, what's it look like? And you would expect that you would have something that would guide you in that process. So that would be called a specification or a drawing. And some of those early drawings were nothing more than a piece of paper that said, here's Earth, here's the moon, go there. <laughs> Figure that out. Yeah, it was pretty bad. We when I went there, all we had was this big poster that General Electric made. I got a picture of it here to show you. I don't know if you can see the camera. And uh, and uh, I would go over there and stare at that thing, trying to figure out what we were going to do. You know, because <laughs> we didn't understand a lot of the aerospace talk that they were talking about. You know, and uh, it, this shows uh, the, the the route they were going to do and what they were going to do and the different things in there. And it's really large, so you could just see what was going on. I, we had that, okay. And then I didn't understand what was going on to so I tried to went to a bookstore to try to find something about the Apollo. Well, you know, this is 1965, and uh, they didn't know anything about Apollo books and stuff. They hadn't even made the drawings yet. Exactly. So I went to this. I found one a children's book, oh. okay, <laughs> and, and we all studied it. It was like two pages at the end that shows some stuff on on the Apollo, and it was pretty good stuff. It, it showed. Uh, oh, I'll show you. It showed the lunar module because we'd never seen it before. <laughs> So here's it has a that's what they we looked at that it gives a little explanation to what this was, and uh, it shows the uh, the Apollo and the service module not the, the actual scale, and it showed the mission some of the, explain some of the mission, what's that? Yeah. yeah this that. is about all we had in those early days because they were still trying to figure out what this mission was and how it was going to work, but the key of our process was the engineering drawing. The drawing was our guide. It told us what had to be done, where it had to go, what to use, and so forth. I'd like to spend just a minute talking about one of my favorite topics, which is you would create a, the engineers would create a drawing and say, here, go do this, this way. And you'd start building or checking to that drawing and then halfway through, or not even halfway through, all of a sudden somebody would say, time out, we have something called an EOC, engineering change order. We've changed our mind. 
You know those three screws over there? Don't put them over there. You put them over here instead. And that up there, well, that's going to be twice as long as it is right now. For, for my job in the engineering side of the department, we hated engineering change orders because it meant going back to the customer and renegotiating. It meant changing all the paperwork and everything down the stream. But for technicians and people on the floor, what did you do with those engineering change orders? Well, what happened, we get these drawings, and uh, the drawings are about this big. They're D-sized drawings, or even bigger. And uh, the engineering changes were this size, okay? And they would staple them to the corner of the space, after the drawing. they staple it to the corner. And uh, we'd, have, we'd get the, the drawings, and they'd have 20 or 30 of these things attached to them. And some of them were just spelling changes. If somebody spelled something wrong. So you had to go through this, all these changes to figure out what the drawing was. And by the time you finished, it was a different drawing, you know. And you can't, you can't mark them. Well, I think we did. But we trying to figure out what, the, what they are for the drawing. So uh, it was a mess, you know. And we'd get in. It was like a big puzzle. It was bad enough trying to put this stuff in than trying to figure out the drawings how to do it. That's all we had were the drawings. We didn't have any training. And uh, no formal training of what all this stuff is supposed to be. We didn't know where the lower equipment bay was. And somebody says, well, that's where that down there. And I think. I'm not sure. And, uh, <laughs> and this is the part that goes on top here. You know, and, so we, and then the drawings is to put it in the lower equipment bay. Well, where the hell is that? You know, so, uh, so we figured out after we'd been there for a while, you got experience is what we did. We, we were, uh, these engineers were following us around and trying to get the drawings on after we put them in. They would put them in, and then we change them, and then you have to go back and do it again. So we had engineers coming in and out all the time from the design section to do it, take, to draw it the way it, the illustrators they had to draw it the way it was. So we didn't have all that stuff until after Apollo One was done. So we were we were, we were like pioneers, you know, the whole thing. Nobody had ever made a spacecraft like that. There doesn't look at anything like the the Mercury and. Uh, one thing I, I, I said, I, the astronauts we were talking to, I says, well, how does this Apollo compared? To the the Gemini and the and the, and the uh, Mercury, oh, he said this thing is huge. And it was I was looking around. This thing's smaller than the inside of a car, you know. <laughs> and, that, that was, was, and then I saw I finally saw one in uh, like a couple years ago. I saw a Gemini, and that thing is like a they're just pack, packed in there like sardines, and it has a little door in the side, and you just they stick the astronauts in, they shut them the door behind, behind them, you know. That was it. Ours, at least the guys could move around a little bit inside there. There's no moving around in those other spacecrafts. It was tough. But, uh, the, our lead man, we were working on that thing in, on Apollo 1, and we got these guys dying on us. You know, our, our lead man died from the stress because we were working so many. He was an older guy. So we were, you know, we were, the guys were like in their 20s. We were early 20s. We, were, we figured we are not going to get heart attacks. But these other guys, the older guys, are over, over 20, 30 years old, you know, that's really hard on those guys. They would have heart attacks. They're not like now, I would have stents and all this. There was nothing for people with heart problems. And we had a whole bunch of guys die from that. Not, in the, not the technicians, not the, not the craft people. The ones who were dying were management and engineers because they had all the stress. And because uh, we could only do one job at a time. Later on, I got promoted to engineering. And on engineering, what they, in engineering, they give you multiple jobs to do at the same time. Whereas a, a technician, they only give you one thing to do. So you just do that and you get done. You come in the next day and do something else. An engineer, you come in and say, well, we got this 30 things to do and uh, we want you to get it done by Friday, you know. And it's really hard on them. So they really try to get their jobs done. And they get, they do, if they get the jobs done a lot of times, they go home, they get the mission accomplished, everything was done by Friday by Friday. They go home and have a heart attack and die and you see them the next day. So that, was, that happened like every week you'd see a guy or two die when I was in engineering, it was, it was kind of disheartening. But uh, people don't realize it. And then we had a lot of problem with divorces. The people were either dying or they were getting divorced or their wives were having nervous breakdowns. The guys never got nervous breakdowns. It was always the wives. <laughs> it was too much stress on them, you know. Yeah. But later on, I, I, had a, I had a nervous breakdown after the program was over with. Uh, when I, it was a lot of stress. But I, I was ready to finish the Apollo. It, it stays with you, that stuff. And uh, the stress. It's fine because you're, you feel like screaming. You're there 17 hours a day, seven, seven days a week, three months at a, sh at, a, at a shot, you know. Then they give you a little break time, like a month, and then you start the next one again. 
It was terrible, you know. So, uh, and, and I, I got moved out to Seal Beach, and after Apollo One, and I worked there for Seal Beach for a while. And then I, I was on loan for Autonetics to do something, and then come back. And we were doing nothing for a while because the whole fire. We were, we were just sitting around, just doing nothing. I was playing chess with some of the guys, and and uh, for three months until they to figure out what they were going to do. A lot of the guys got laid off at that time period, and then they they started the program over again, and. Uh, we lost some of our key people, so it started going. But it was everybody was more vigilant of, of their job then, and that was really good because that's what got us there. You know, the, the, the attitude of the whole company changed. Well, it was that, and I would offer to the audience that uh, it was people like Anthony. When you stop to figure that the the dreamers in Washington who said go to the moon and the NASA and the engineers who gave contracts and direction, when you really ask yourself, how did we get to the moon? It's Anthony and people like Anthony who got us to the moon. They made it real. They made it happen. These were the craftspeople. And that's where it all happened. We have only have time, and I have one more question I we have to ask you, Anthony. Where were you when Apollo 11 and Neil put his boot on the moon? I was in working for ITT Barton Instruments in Monterey Pass Road in, in, uh, in Monterey Park. And uh, it was I had got, just got laid off about a month before. What happened, we had 30,000 employees. And when I got laid off we, uh, in 68, we had... Uh, 30,000 employees. By this, by uh, of June of '69, uh, when the, the landing was in July, mm -hmm. uh, they, we had about 8,000 employees. They were laying everybody off. So I, I was not any different. I took the voluntary layoff because I, I was supposed to take another cut. And I was talking about the senior system. I went back from engineering. I got busted at the senior technician again. Back to regular. I was going to go back to regular technicians. Says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to see if I get a job. Because I, there's going to be a mass rush trying to get jobs when you get out. Yeah. Well, that. So I was working at ITD Barn Entrance, and I saw him land on the moon. And I was a supervisor there. And uh, I asked my boss, is it okay to stay? These guys, they landed. Can we get them go back to work? He says, no, this is an epic moment in, in history. Let them stay. So we stayed. We were in the lunchroom, and they, had, they set up the computers. So I was worried about my job. I, I felt really pleased that they we had accomplished our mission, but I felt a little bit robbed because I didn't get to participate in that. You know, it's, I mean, a, a lot of guys felt like the same way. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's great we got there, but you know, our our reward is we lost our job. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> job is finished. Yeah, right. Don't need you anymore, right? <laughs> this, 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 they boot you out the door, and I said, don't slam, let the door slam you in the back. Here we are in the 50th anniversary of that moon landing. And you definitely were part of that history. How do you feel about it today? Well, I feel great that we did that. I, I thought they, they they made a big mistake going to the space shuttle. I thought they we had all these spacecraft <laughs> on the line, and they should have just kept going and and kept going to the moon. And the decision was to the scientists and the and the, and the Apollo people, the man. The people, the manned people, and the people who are assigned as unmanned, there was always a battle against them. Those guys were always saying, you can't be sending you guys to the moon. They should let us have all the money and all the glory because they wanted to go see these planets and stuff like that, and the money should go to them. So then they go to satellites and stuff like that. It's okay to have them make the space shuttle so they can do a little scientific work on, on, in the space. Now, my attitude is that we should try to go pioneer, try to get find out, go as far as we can, and let the, the scientists fall, you know. So there was a big debate on that, and they won. It was you know, NASA said, well, there's a good, after Apollo 13, they almost lost a guy there. And then we lost two, uh, a, a thing that guides the, sh the ship, there's an inertial guidance system. That, that broke down on two of them, three of them didn't work. And that's what controls the ship. They had this other thing to control, they had a, a sextant. It's like when you're going around the moon, you, have, you can actually run those uh, spacecraft all the way around the, the moon and, and land them without any astronaut in them, okay? That's, that was all remote control could be done. But the astronaut had to, uh, to do the final, sometimes they made mistakes, you know? 
uh, like at uh, Apollo 11, they, when they landed, they had all these rocks and stuff that was not coming to the right spot. So Neil Armstrong took control of it and moved it over. He almost ran out of fuel, and then they landed it. So he landed in a better location. Or if they would have landed, they would have. They probably would have landed, but it would have been all crooked, and yeah. he couldn't la launch off the, the, yeah. the space stuff. And that was my worry was that was good was that. Yeah, I always back. thought they weren't going to make it from from the get go. I thought. I didn't, I didn't think about the fire thing. You know, there was, I figured, especially when they went around the moon and in, 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 in Christmas time, the year before, they made it around there. I said, they're going to make it, they're going to get to the moon, but I don't think they'll be able to launch because it had used to take all of Cape Canaveral to try to launch that. They had all those technicians and engineers, and they have the countdowns, they stop. and all. They didn't going to have that when they get when they launch from the, from the moon. You know, we didn't have the technicians or anybody to fix anything down there. They just were going to have to make it go. So a lot I figured of trust. they were going to get. I, I thought they was going to fail there, yeah. and they didn't. It was really good. They made it back, and it was perfect. No. One of the uh, lessons learned from the early Apollo program, and then transferred later to shuttle. Uh, prior, in the early days of cost plus contracts with the government, in order for you to bid a contract for the government. You had to show and prove to them that you are capable of doing the job. So that meant on a program like Apollo, as big as it was, any contractor submitting a proposal, you had to show, if you said it was going to take 100,000 people to do this job, you better have 100,000 people on your payroll. You had to hire everybody before the fact. Now, if I hire 100,000 people, but I don't have the contract, I don't even have the specifications, what do those people do? I'm paying them to do nothing, or the government is anyway. So what was realized was you need, in any contract procurement, you need to phase the employment. So how does that work? Well, it says that in the case of a program like Shuttle, in the beginning, you do need design engineers. You need project people. You don't need inspectors. You don't even need draftsmen necessarily. You don't even you don't need manufacturing people because you've got nothing to make. So you phase your employment. You hire the the engineers, the designers, those structural people. You hire them first, and then. As the drawings get released, as the production starts, you hire them, but you start laying off the people that you don't, you've already used. And that's basically what happened with Apollo. That was the, the, the process. So when we got to 68, there were a couple of things happening. We already had vehicles in production, so it was more a work for the technicians, the inspectors. The drawings were pretty firm. Of course, we didn't want NASA to keep changing things because that added more work. Those e engineering change orders in my department that we were processing were costing $50,000 for every piece of paper that came through as a change order. So we had an incentive to get rid of those and keep those down. But the wild card that we hadn't counted on, which precipitated the big layoffs in 68, 69, 70, was the decisions by Washington not to continue with the Apollo lunar exploration. They decided they wanted to invest all of their money into a new space truck, the space shuttle. And so with all that emphasis shifting, it meant that we had very little reason or funds to keep those other people. And up to that time, the aerospace industry was, as, as we've described, if one contract was shut down at one company, eh, everybody ran over to the next company that had a contract and got a job there. And when that one shut down, you went over to the next one. And so it was a round robin type of yeah, affair. Yeah, Harold All right, but what happened at the end of Apollo in 68 was there were many people who said, you know what? I'm tired of running around and doing that. I'm getting out of aerospace. And coincidentally, or not, at that time, here in Southern California, we had an industry that was exploding that demanded the kind of tech we had in aerospace. 
the motion picture industry. They were going into electronics, computers, CGI. They wanted to do more special effects. They needed high quality, smart technicians. So a lot of our folks said, hey Joe, what are you going to do now that you're laid off? You gonna go try Lockheed or one of No, I'm getting out of this business. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine in the lab, I asked him that very question and I said, Harry, he was getting laid off. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I bought a pig farm down in Georgia. <laughs> So, okay, we're going we're gonna to squeak in one more question. Okay, I'll be very brief then. You said when the astronaut was inspecting Apollo 1, hung the lemon there? <laughs> no, not an inspector. He's an astronaut. No, no, that's what I said. When the astronaut was inspecting Apollo 1, he hung the He was an inspector. Gus Grissom, yes. Right, Gus yeah, Grissom. He was in the lemon. And so whether, did he share with you what were some of the specific problems or that he felt uneasy? He didn't despair anything with me because I was a grunt, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't talk to us guys, but one guy was uh, Griffin, I think his name was Griffin, and he, we and him, we were same age, so we were uh, almost same age, and I, I exchanged knowledge because I said I'd like to go in space too, but I figured the way to get up there was get this stuff going so I could go up there as a technician and work on, on space stations and stuff. Well, that never happened because the, the program got killed, you know, and uh, they went to the space shuttle and, and that was it, you know. They, didn't, they stopped the space exploration. Deep space exploration got killed at that time. The protocol was for the astronauts to be there with their vehicle, and that's exactly what Gus and, and Edwin. And so they would come down and they would roll up their sleeves, they would get in there, and they were, there were many things. There were things like positions of the switches. I'm gonna be in this couch and I gotta go flip this, and they're looking at their operational procedures and they say, I don't like that, that switch. As a matter of fact, one of the, the, the early things was a lot of our toggle switches were just bare toggle switches, which meant you just, you have a panel with 15, 20 toggle switches on it. Well, they got in there, one of the astronauts got in there, he put his glove on, and the, the procedure said, activate switch number, boom, boom, boom. Well, with the, the finger and the size of the glove, he goes, boom, 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 and flip 10 switches all at one time. And so he says, you know what? And he gets out, he doesn't talk to the tech, he goes, talks to the engineers, and he says, guys, this ain't gonna work. So the redesign on that, where it's what we call switch guards. They're little U-shaped pieces of, of wire that come out on the, each side. So the only way you can flip the toggle is to come in at the point and then flip it this way. So that was the kind of thing that they were involved in. They were, you know, it's like, gee, wouldn't it be great if you bought a new car and you got to go down to the factory before the car rolled off the line and you got to sit in it and play with everything and say, you know, I, I really don't like the way that vent works over here and I think it ought to be over there. All of the astronauts had that opportunity, participated, and that's another factor that made the program so successful, was the integration of the customer with the contractors and the designers. Okay, so on our end, they had to take that panel, so it was like a dash, dash panel with all the stuff, take it off, <laughs> put it back in, and then they had to run that test we talked about, it took three months all over again because they had to test everything because it's connected to the whole Barrett, so. It's, uh, it because, right, because when that astronaut went back home to NASA, Houston, or headquarters, and he said, yeah, I was down there, and I didn't like this the way it was, and I went to the engineer, and we changed our mind. Well, it doesn't end there, because now it goes over to the project office, and the project office says, oh, you want to make that change? Well, that's a $1.2 million hit to the contract. And as sooner or later it gets to a point in the system where they say, time out, we ain't gonna pay for that. We don't wanna do that. And so, negotiation. And, and just as Anthony's saying, you can see how this process is long, complex, frustrating, and very stressful. 
And yeah, like the draftsmen, they, if you work with draftsmen, they don't want to make changes. <laughs> no, they, they're, they're really, so you, you got to hear all the chatter that so they're going to make a change. You have to ignore that and just do your job, you know. You know, make it, they, didn't, they weren't concerned about, they had already finished their job. They felt the job was complete. We felt the same way too when we put the panels and put them back in again. It was like a pain in the butt, you know, so it's the way it was, you know. It's part of, the, it's part of your job. I used to tell the guys, this is what they pay us for, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of film and time. I want to thank you, Anthony, for an incredible yeah. time. And thank I you. learned much myself as well. And Anthony has, has an incredible presentation he does on Apollo that we're going to try and get scheduled here at the center. Um, we have to time it with his trips to Los Angeles. Uh, but in the meantime, Go to YouTube. He has a wonderful YouTube presentation that is great to watch as well. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you.